All right, Daniel. Yes, sir. Daniel, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Um, born and raised in East Los Angeles um, on 3rd and 4th by, everybody knows the restaurant, King Taco. <laughs> so yeah, off the 710 right there. And tell me about your family growing up. Um, my family growing up, um, my mother was from a neighborhood known as Westside Canton. Um, and my dad's side of my family, which uh, raised me, is from Maravilla. Um, I only lived with my mom for a short period of time, like maybe till I was like four years old, till I was taken away by social services and um, placed with my grandfather because my dad was in prison at the time. So Why did your mom lose you? My mom lost me because of her addiction. She was mm -hmm. um, in and out of prison and she was fighting a battle that, I mean, I don't think she could comprehend how big that battle was, you know, addiction. Anybody that fights addiction knows how hard that is, you know. So, yeah, I got taken away. Um, social services had me and my grandfather and grandmother, my my mom's mom, they went to battle for me, like in court. So they were I was in and out of court for a couple of years of them trying to get custody of me until I was finally placed with my grandfather and raised in East Los Angeles. How would you describe your childhood in general? Um, my childhood in general was not good. I was, um, I used to see my mom um, use heroin. Well, we call it slamming dope. So I used to wake up to that almost every morning. And um, she used to, in the meantime, while her boyfriend at the time, he was one of the, like a, a real well-known um, dealer. He would leave to work and he would leave her to sell dope throughout the day to make money for her. And she would be using a lot of, a lot of it. So, when he would get home, you know, she didn't have a, a lot of the money wasn't accounted for or a lot of dope was missing. So she would get beat down like bad. And that happened on the daily. Like, so I got to see that happening. That was a very, um, it's a, it's a mess of thing for a little kid to see, you know? And, and I can't, I couldn't do nothing to help her. What could I do? You know, I'm just a little boy, yeah. but, um, yeah, he placed his hands on me a couple of times and, um, I don't know. I don't, I can't remember how I was taken away, but. I'm sure they seen bruises on me or whatever. So yeah, social service that got involved and, and she ended up going to prison. Um, that guy, I think he, he went to prison for a little bit and I got placed with my grandparents, well, my grandfather on my dad's side. And you're living in a, a neighborhood where the gangs are thick. Well, yeah. So my, my grandfather, me growing up in, on my grandfather's side, my grandpa, my grandfather was actually a uh, first generation from my neighborhood, Maravilla. So Maravilla, how I was raised was it wasn't a gang, a gang thing, like a gang aspect. Like um, he would talk to me about how we were a righteous barrio, like um, we we protected our people, and um, I was raised in that sense of, of the just the respect of our people. You know, you gotta. This is this is your this is your community, so you gotta take care of it. But then I got the whole the whole knowledge of the, of the, the real gang banging when my dad came out of prison, and then he um, he just put me up on a lot of stuff where you know how to conduct yourself as a man. This is what we're really fighting for, and um, you're always gonna be uh, fighting with with you know different other other neighborhoods that are always trying to prove themselves. So. You got to you got to always be the aggressor like um, you, you can't wait till somebody hits you up. You got to be the one and especially because I'm, I'm short in stature, you know, I got to be the aggressor and the dominant one to show to show force that, you know, don't don't mess around with me. And you joined the gang at what age? Um, I joined the gang in, on January 5th in 1992 on my birthday. I got jumped in. I was 10 years old, <laughs> 10 years old. Yeah. I assume you've done some jail and prison time. Um, I've done quite a few jail time. Um, fortunate not to hit the prison system. Mm. So very thankful. I have fought life sentences that, you know, I think God was with me for the most part because I overcame that. Wow. What, what is it about a young man that makes that gang life so attractive? I mean, is, is it attractive or you're forced into it or, or there's no choice for you? How do you, how do you feel at the time? Um, for me, it was more of a, of a family thing. It was more my grandfather. Your dad, your dad did my it. My grandfather, my dad, my dad was from my neighborhood. All um, oh, your role models. And these were, yeah, they were they were my role models. But not only them, my my grandfather was older. He was an older gentleman. He was um, he was born in 1918. My dad was born in 1940. So these were already. My dad had me when he was 42 years old already. 
So all his homeboys that would come over to the house, they were all older, like what you would consider veteranos already. And the respect that I seen in them and that they showed me because of my dad and my uncles, um, it, it was something that I think I craved. Like I, I wanted that. I seen, I wanted to be respected like that. So I, I seek that out, you know, with different guys that I met when I was, when I got busted or even out here, like in school, like I wanted that. I wanted to, um, I guess wanting to make a name for yourself, you know? Wanted to show that that alpha male, like, you know, I'm the leader, I'm the one. I want to be picked first for basketball. I want to be this and that. But, um, yeah, I think it's something that I, I searched for. It was more of a family thing with me. Um, there's different reasons why people join gangs now, like, you know, for, to show out or, you know, just looking for a dad that they didn't have or whatever. I mean, obviously, I have my dad in my life. He was always in and out of prison, but I did have my grandfather, so I, that's no excuse, you know. But I think I still search for, you know, somebody probably to look up to that was around my age bracket. So, um, yeah, I got into my neighborhood and at a very young age. Um, and I had no comprehension of, of what I was really getting myself into with the whole politics side. Because at that time, my neighborhood um, was going at it with a certain organization that was, you know, running the whole show. and and that was a force to be reckoned with, you know, and especially at a, a little boy, I'm um, going at it with the older men, you know, that I had no idea, you know, so um, I really had to be on my P's and Q's. You grew up fast. You had, to, you had to run before you can crawl. And Maravilla is, is one of the, I mean, there's a lot of notorious gangs, especially in LA, but Maravilla seems to be like the, one of the most notorious right. of all. Right. What, what is the history of, of Maravilla? Do you know? So the history of Maravilla, um, it's a, a righteous, what would you would consider a righteous barrio or town um, before East Los Angeles was, was even like named East Los Angeles. This side of would be the, the bridges that connect downtown Los Angeles um, was a town of Maravilla when the borders were still open between Mexico and um, the United States. So yeah, a lot of our, our um, older homeboys would be considered pachucos. Um, they would actually go at it with like um, military personnel that were partying or on leave. And um, that, that's where the whole story of the Zuzu riots come in to play. And um, just our people were, were, how do you say it, were um, suppressed, you know, like looked down upon, like we were less than or we weren't good enough. Um, my grandfather at that time, um, he actually, you know, he actually tried to join the Navy. He did join the Navy. and. Um, He's seen the same, I don't want to say racism, but kind of it kind of is, you know, looked down upon and, you know, you couldn't move up and rank, you know, you couldn't, um, they always had, um, and it's not a racial thing, but I, I think it's kind of like they look down on our people, you know, that we weren't good enough to be a certain rank or whatever, you know, that's what, that's how he explained it to me, you know, so he ended up leaving, you know, the Navy and just coming back and, um, living his life. He got married and, you know, everything that I learned from, I learned from him. him. As, a, as a young man, as a 10 year old boy, right? you, uh, when, when, when did you first realize you were into something much heavier than just joining <laughs> a club? And that, um, I, th I think within the first two years when, uh, older gentlemen are, are, um, you know, they see who I'm hanging out with, um, fights that we would get into when I would go like to grab food with, with older homeboys or whatever. And um, yeah, it wasn't no game, you know. It was a it was a situation I was put in where you can't run. If, if you run, your your own homeboys are gonna get you, you know. So you really have to um, you have to show, you know, that you're down for it. <laughs> you're down for the cause. You're 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 down to ride with your homeboys, and that and it, not in that you're down, but it's something that you believe in that you want to show. You know, we're we're like everybody says the, the gang members now like our neighborhood's the best, or our neighborhood's the deepest, or our neighborhood puts in more work than your neighborhood. And that's something that I think a lot of neighborhoods, like my, for myself at that age, I was very ignorant. You know, I, th I thought that. I thought that we're the number one neighborhood. You know, we're the deepest. We're, we're the first neighborhood. Like, you know, we got to put it down. You know, we got to show that and that we look down on other neighborhoods. Like, you ain't nothing. You don't live in a righteous neighborhood. You ain't, um, you don't live like, like, like we live, you know. So, um, and little did I know, you know, they're living the same, they're living the same way. You know, I just, I just was stuck in that, that, that mindset because of, you know, how I was raised, you know, but yeah, it was a very, um, it was a very messed up time. And what, what kind of activities does the gang get into in, in the community? I mean, are you 
are you controlling some of the yeah we're we're um i mean as much as i want to say we're protecting the community we're destroying our community we're taxing um local vendors we're um um also while we're trying to be taxed by, by our organization you got to watch out for homeboys that are playing both sides you gotta um you know at, at that time um rocco kane was still very prevalent in the neighborhood so you know you had to learn a way to make money also so you could get guns or you could get a, a car or whatever because you want to show that that um you know you look at an older home but you pull up in a nice ass car you want that too and you go hey how do I do that how do I start off and and I remember bringing an older homeboy into my house I remember I, I was 14 years old and I stuck him into my I snuck him into my house and um he brought like half a key into my pad and then he was showing me how to rock it up like this whole brick of cocaine and I'm right there all fascinated you know at this this gang member that's all blasted tatted up. And, you know, I have him in my house. I'm trying to have him be quiet because I don't want him to wake my grandpa up, you know. And um, he's showing me how to how to cut dope up and make money and get what he had. He had three low riders. He had an SUV. He had his own house already. And he's only, what, 24 years old, 23 years old. And But I looked up to that. Like, I wanted that. Everything, the respect that he got. Now it was something not, I mean, my grandfather taught me like a righteous side. But now it's more of a, a dominant side. And. And, and a mischievous side, like, you know, and I, I, I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted to pull up in my ride with my, with my strap and show force. I wanted to get that respect of, hey, you know, homeboys coming down or whatever. I wanted that. I think a lot of young homeboys want that. Yeah, they it's, want, it's, it's almost like a young male thing. Yeah, it's a young the male. The testosterone is so, yeah. <laughs> is so heavy in their veins that yeah. they, their mm. violence and domination and all that kind of thing is... is just part of who they are at that age. Yeah, really. Do, do you find you've mellowed now? How, how old are you now? I'm 40 years old. Um, I feel, yeah, I definitely mellowed down, definitely. Um, but I think, um, and I don't want to say it's a, a downfall, but in a way it is a downfall because I still demand respect. I still, um, I still conduct myself a certain way when I'm around uh, certain people um, just because I know how they are. Or I, I think I judge people a lot, which maybe I shouldn't, but that's how I feel I'm still alive by judging because most of the time I've been right. You know, if, a, if I feel a person is, is up to something like trying to snake me out, um, I want to have the upper hand, you know? So yeah, I think I'm, you always got to be ready. You know, that day that you, you decide to relax or, or just chill, that's the day you're going to get taken out, you know? And I don't want, I don't want to be taken out. A big thing in, in growing up when I was younger was you know, my dad told me that you don't ever want to get taken out by somebody trying to earn their name, like a nobody. You know, make sure that, that somebody is, um, like, is up there in the game, you know. And, um, you know, that's, I don't want to get taken out by somebody trying to earn their name. I don't want to, I don't want to get caught slipping or lacking, as they say today. Um, so, yeah, I, I try to stay ready, even when I'm with my children. You know, we'll go in the grocery store or... I pick out. I pick what gas station to go to. You got to know the neighborhood that you're going into. You know, you got to know the politics in the in that that neighborhood that's going on. You know, that neighborhood might have a green light, or your car might look like somebody in that neighborhood that just shot at another neighborhood. So you got to be prepared for anything. You know, I have my neighborhood in, in front of me, in the back of me, so they can see me coming. It, it just takes a glance into my car to see the back of my head or the front of my head. So I got to really be prepared. You know, this isn't a guessing game. This is, I, I know that guy from Maravilla is right here. This is the kind of car he drives. This is where he works at. So you gotta, you gotta be, you know, ready at all times. The, the concept that joining a gang is gonna you know, lead to either a life in prison or a life in a grave. Does that hit you as, as a young man or do you just like ignore it and move on? Um, no, for us, well, for myself, um, it wasn't anything to ignore. It was kind of being prepared for prison. They're literally preparing you for prison. Um, everything that I got taught from my dad, which um, it was, um, it was wisdom in there. Your dad spent how many years in prison? Uh, he was in and out of prison. He did five years, went back, did like seven years, went back, did you know four more years. My uncle, the same thing. My cousins, the same thing. And and it seemed like my house was like all the homies from Maravilla, and not and not just from my clique, but like from different cliques around my house. Um, so I got that, we call it flecha or class. 
we got that that um that schooling from them you know how to how to make a, a shank how to um how to cook in there you know um you you're getting all this etiquette shown to you of how to conduct yourself in prison yeah in prison and we're out here in the street we're little kids like you know why why are you teaching us that but learning all that at a young age i think it, it benefited me too because it's it's showing how to conduct myself with a, with men out here in the street there's guys that come out of prison and they expect you to show respect they expect you to say excuse me when you pass them by they expect you not to step on their shoes that's a big form of disrespect walking in front of somebody and not saying excuse me not looking a man in his eyes when you shake their hand that's a big form of, dis of disrespect and now it's gotten so watered down where you know guys use the, the word bitch they use the, the, you know, the word, even the word fool, like to say, what's up, fool? Like, that's just, don't fucking talk to me like that. Who the fuck you think you're talking to? You know, um, it's just, a, you know, it's, there's different levels of, of respect that, that certain individuals demand. And I think learning from these older gentlemen at that time, I demanded the same thing as them. So, you know, to, to run into a homeboy that was around my age at that time, that wasn't getting that same schooling, it was kind of a shock to them. What do you mean? Like, don't call you fool. Like, yeah. And fucking crack you in your mouth. Like, don't talk to me like that. So, you know, you got to show it with that. You know, you can't just talk about it. You can't just say, oh, I'm this type of person. You got to live like that. You have to live like that. Do you, do you feel like the, uh, the gangs, especially in L.A., have become more watered down or weaker than they were when you or your father? Right. Real watered down. Throughout the decades, generations, it's real watered down. Our, our neighborhood is a generational neighborhood. Like a, lo a lot of, if you talk to a lot of the, the, well, around my age or maybe in the 30s, early 30s, maybe late 20s, their, their dads are from the neighborhood. Their grandfathers were from the neighborhood. Their grandfathers were pachucos too. So um, it's, a, it's just passed down, you know? I think in the 90s though, it started getting watered down when they started implementing all these new laws. Is, you know, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think it's law enforcement that's created that, or is it just society as a whole has become the men have become more spineless or, or something like that? I think not spineless, but I think not knowing the true foundation of what we what we're supposed to stand for, and um, getting a whole generation locked up and incarcerated, like with the three strikes law, and now you don't got fathers that are able to give that that to their or pass that down. The guidance. So now these kids are are learning from hip hop. They're learning from the rap game. They're learning all this stuff. And, you know, you got, you got, which in my days, the homeboys never used that, you know, the N-word. They never used that, you know. And now you got a whole bunch of homeboys using that word. And they have no idea what that term means, you know. That's not our culture. That's not, we're not supposed to conduct ourselves in that manner, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, people that are, that are around my age, we kind of, we frown upon that, you know. It's not the way you should conduct yourself. You should respect your mom. You should respect your, your elders. You should, um, you know, look out for, you know, the women in your community walking with the children. They should feel safer around you than they do around the cops, you know? You you have children? Yes, I do. Sons or daughters? I got, I have 10 kids. I have six six boys and four girls. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So your your boys, do you, do you see them following dad's footsteps? Um, I've seen some of them try. Um, but then again, I didn't raise them like that. I, I've been there for my baby, my, my kids. I call them my babies, but they're my, my children. You know, I try to everything I, I, I show them or teach them. I don't ever want to give them the short answer. I want to explain it to them, them into detail, like but skid but row. They see, but they see dad with all the uh, tattoos they see on me. His face. They see me and, the, and they want just what I wanted, you know. So I know the more that I try and stop them, the more it's going to push them to rebel. So I try to just have a, a, a relationship with them and explain things and why you shouldn't do that or the choices, you know. Show them the, the the downfall that I had in my life, you know, being homeless or getting addicted to dope, you know, and then trying to explain to them so they don't do it, you know. It's going to be in front of you, but this is the decision. This is the outcome that's going to happen. You know, you're going to get busted. You're going to go to, you're going to do life or you're going to be dead. And they, they know that. They see I have a lot of homeboys that have passed away from overdose, from being shot by the cops, from suicide. Um, yeah, so I try to, you know, I just try to have a relationship with them before anything, before I say no, don't do that. I think the first thing as, as parents, we tell our kids is the first word that they learn is no. <laughs> They're going into the cabinet, no, don't do that. No, no, no. Instead of saying, this is why you shouldn't do it. Teach them to think. Right. 
if you had your life to live all over again, do you think you, you would have done anything differently? Definitely. Definitely. I think um, I still I still think the, the wisdom that I got, I call it wisdom for my dad and my, my grandfather and my uncles. Um, I think it was very important. It's very important to be street savvy, to know where you're at. People might might look at this and say it's it's an ignorant thing or you shouldn't live that or you should have finished school or you should have did this and that. And I think my answer to that is schooling starts at home. Schooling starts with your moral system. School starts with your with your etiquette, with your parents showing you how to make your bed, with them showing you how to make breakfast, how to how to take care of yourself. Because one day I'm not going to be here and I'm going I'm to hope that my kids um, have that moral system embedded in them, you know, that they're going to be able to conduct themselves around other men. So they're respected and not disrespected. You got everybody disrespecting everybody and especially people that they don't know. I tell my kids about, you know, I hear a lot, like I, I was hanging around with my kids one time and their friends were gossiping about other people. And I tell them, you know what, mijo? When you, when you hear somebody gossip about somebody else, you're only getting 5% five, five of who that person really is. You don't know who that person is. That person could end up being your best friend. That person could end up giving you, putting money in your books when you're busted. That person could, could save your life one day. I tell people that. Don't, don't disrespect me. You know, don't doubt, you know, how far I've come. I could be the person to save your life one day. I, but I could also be the person to take it. So I think you should come out with everybody with respect, you know. You been in love before? Yes, I have. Yeah, I've been in love. Um, I always said when I was younger, it's funny, I always said I, I wanted to be married at 25. I don't know why that was a, an age, a good age for me or that I thought it was. But today, uh, looking back uh, at my age now, that's a young age, <laughs> you know, but um, I think um, love is a beautiful thing, you know. I think that a, a lot of people have misconstrued love, though. Yeah. You know, they say they're in love with somebody and they're just in like with them or they're just content with their everyday systematic way of living that they become privy to. I don't think that they're in love and they go ahead and get married because they want to put a label on it or stamp it. And most of the time that ends in divorce and it's sad, you know, most people that haven't gotten married stay together for the longest period of time. That's beautiful to wake up to, to wake up to somebody that has your back. Somebody that wants you, wants to push you to do better. Somebody that's going to correct you when you're wrong, even if they love you. I think correction is love, you know, or love, I mean, correcting the person that you're with, you know. What, what do you think the whole gang attraction is? Is I mean, I, I see, you don't see, you only see like the Latin, Latin American communities or the, uh, the African American communities kind of getting involved usually. There's not many white gangs, so. Um, what, why, why do you think that is? Is it, is it the, the, poor, the fact that these communities are poorer? I think literally from, um, I study a lot. I read a lot. Um, I, I think I'm a deep thinker. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a system that we're put into. Part of it to do with gentrification. A lot of it to do with, um, certain restrictions that are put on our so-called minority communities um, and come to find out we're not a minority. We're not. We're a majority of people out here. We're deep black and brown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a system, a systematic thing like, you know, that we're put into. It also becomes a mindset too. Right, and it becomes a mindset. You know, why is there liquor stores in every corner? Why do we have all this stuff? Why do why does our rank go up? You know, why do we get pushed out of our communities? You know, it seems that we're getting pushed out of, every other day. We're getting pushed out of something. Look at the whole Dodger Stadium thing. You know, um, those are three communities that got pushed out. You know, to build a stadium for what? Why? Why do these people get displaced from their houses? You know, the seven ten freeway. When my when my grandpa you know was younger. A lot of his friends got taken out of their homes to build that freeway. Yeah, we do need a pathway to travel, but, you know, don't just rip people out of their homes. You know, this is where you live. Imagine somebody going to your mom's house and ripping her out of her house, you know, and telling her, you know, to get out of here. The, the violence that you get involved in when you're in, in a gang 
gets pretty extreme sometimes. Definitely. Do you have any examples of things you can share? Yeah. Um, you don't need to name names. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of good friends die. I've had a lot of good friends die, get set up, you know, by the police. Um, I've had friends. Um, I'll give you one story with all the names. I had a good friend of mine. He used to um, he used to look out for me. He used to help me fix my. I used to have back in, in the '90s GT GT um, you know dynos and the whole bicycle thing was really cool and you know we everybody wanted a bike. If you had a GT dyno or GT freestyle, that was a thing to have, you know. So um, this guy would help me fix my bike together, put my you know pegs on it and all this and that. He used to give me a lot of schooling in the neighborhood, and um, he got involved in like a lot of politics stuff and. Um, he got thrown off the freeway. He got thrown off the freeway because he didn't want to pay a certain amount or he didn't want to pay no amount. And um, he was still alive and he crawled to try to get off. And they went down there and threw him into several more cars. And the people that did it paid for his funeral. That's crazy. Hmm. Like who does that? But that's how, how, how treacherous this world is. That's how treacherous you find homies to be. A lot of people don't know, a lot of younger homies don't, don't get that side until you get involved in some real, some real stuff. It ain't just about hopping, the, hopping out the car and going to go hit up a dude in, his, in the neighborhood. Um, it, it, a lot of politics get involved in it, you know? I'm not gonna get deep into that, but you know, a lot of it has to do with money. And a lot of people are willing to do a lot of, a lot of evil shit over money, you know? Even sell out their own family members. So you gotta be very, very careful, you know? You were around for the drive-by era, right? Yeah. Yeah, the drive-by era was, um, we, we actually got, um, you know, we call them juntas with their meetings. And um, that was a big no-no. You got a green light if you did a drive-by, if you don't get off the car. And it was a whole thing. Like, we never, we never respected that anyways. You know, you'll find very few of our homeboys from my neighborhood, and not trying to be boastful in any way, but we, our homeboys really never did that. You know, we get off the car, and look you in your eyes, you know. The more the more personal, the more personal you got with 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 an with an enemy or a so-called enemy, the more um, stature you got. So why use a gun when you could use a knife? Anybody could use a gun, but to get up and personal and, and go toe to toe with somebody, that that's a man. That's a man, you know. What character trait is most valuable? In, in a gang? Is it integrity? Is it? Uh... Um, and uh, it's not a good trait, but definitely not integrity. I think being a vicious person to be, a to killer. be, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a saying in that movie, A Bronx Tale, right? Where he says, would you rather be respected or loved or, or feared, feared or loved, right? And, um, uh, I think to be feared is definitely um, gonna get you somewhere in, in a gang. The more, the more willing, the more willingness you have to do something really ugly, that's what's gonna get you. You know, be a dominant person in your neighborhood. Get you feared. People are gonna be willing to listen to you, listen to your instructions, um, go do damage to another neighborhood. Um, yeah, you gotta be really. Um, you gotta be really, how do you say it, um, strategical. You know, there's a there's a a lot of homeboys cross out their walls, and I and I talk about this was in my younger younger days when we used to write on walls, and you see neighborhoods hit up on walls, and they go like a minute later they're crossed out. Like, why are you gonna wait for somebody to cross you out? We used to wait for them to cross us out across the street, three cars down, wait to see. Let's wait for them and get them. You know. Not saying murder or nothing, but, you know, give them the beat down of their life. You know, um, don't ever give the, the opposition a chance. Always be, always be on the, the offensive, you know. Do you believe in karma? Oh, definitely. Definitely. How does karma play out in your life? It plays out every day. Every day. And I'm sure I still got a lot of karma. And I know it's going to fall back on my, my, my kids. So now I really try to tiptoe about decisions that I make, um, the way I conduct myself. Um, I don't want that, that to come back to them or myself. So I just try to live by, 
I, I try to live a, a respectful life now. You know, I take care of my kids. Um, I'm a tattoo artist now. Um, so I just try to lead by, by example. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy no more. I'm not trying to be that alpha male no more, you know? So I just, I just want to be, I want to be normal. I want to be accepted. I want to, um, I want to be loved. You know, I don't want to be feared no more. I don't care about that. I want to, I want people to enjoy my company. I want people to benefit from maybe things that I'm saying to them, you know? Do you feel like life is unfair? In a way, um, when I get down to the whole system, systematic thing, but in general, no, I don't, I, I think it's pretty fair. I think that, and it, it sucks um, to, to say it like this, but I think a lot of people deserve what has happened to them or what's going to happen to them um, just because of their, and I think it's a curse on their bloodline, literally. Like if, you're, if one of your forefathers did some evil shit, that karma is going to come back to you. It's going to come back to you. Clean your life up, you know? What are you afraid of at this point in your life? Um, I'm afraid of dying with no accomplishment. I'm afraid of not leaving a legacy behind. I'm afraid of not being a good father. I'm afraid of um, losing people that I care about, that I love. Um, I always, I, I live by a mindset that what are people going to remember you when you pass away? You know, I don't want them to remember me as a gang member. I don't want them to remember me as a tattoo artist. I don't want them to remember me as anything but benefiting off of some sort of wisdom I gave them one time. Hey, he helped me out. Or he told me not to go do this. Or he was there for me to talk to me. He gave me a hug one time. Um, he took me out to lunch and was there for me at my time of need. I would like to be known for something like that. Daniel, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? The most important lesson is there's so many. Um, That's a great answer. <laughs> there's so many, bro. Um, live life with no expectations. We expect so much from people because of how we were raised, but we have no idea what they're going through. You know, we shouldn't expect so much. You know, we may want that, but, you know, I think when we, ex we're all, we always let ourselves down, especially when we're in love with somebody else, we expect them to be a certain way. We expect them to be the most loyalist person in the world. And we, that's our downfall. You know, we get let down, we get let down, and that affects our, our, our spirit, you know? We end up conducting ourselves a certain way, acting foolish, being spiteful, being resentful, and we go make stupid decisions because of the expectations that we had of another person. So just be happy. Be happy for what you do got. Be happy that you woke up and you have breath in your lungs. Be happy that you get to wake up and learn from somebody you're watching on YouTube. Be happy that somebody took the time to conversate with you. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, bro, for Super having me. Appreciate you. Thanks, man.